What I can't figure out is how do you say you love me? And how do you give me the good things I want? And how do you hear me tell you what I don't like? And yet somehow you find a way to put on my plate what you know I don't want. Would you bow and be in prayer with me? Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. David declares in the Psalms, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. David understood that every now and then there's going to come a moment when you need the word of God in your heart because you may not be able to have a Bible in your hand. Which is a nice way of saying that there ought to be some scriptures you have embedded in your heart that you can draw on when you need them in life. You need more than Jesus wept. When you find all hell breaking loose in your life, you got to pull on all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. When it seems like God is moving just a little bit behind schedule, you got to remind yourself, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. When your coworker has gotten on your last good nerve, in your heart, you got to have some fret not thyself over evildoers. Neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. And y'all ain't nothing like watching God cut grass. There's some scriptures you got to have deep in your heart. And one of the most powerful scriptures that I want to embed in your heart today and pray that you will not leave this service another day without reminding yourself of these words. It's a powerful passage of scripture that is uttered on the lips of a man named Job. And in the book of Job, right before the book of Psalms, if you can navigate to the 13th chapter, I want to show you a passage of scripture that ought to make you shout. Job chapter 13. If you're physically able, won't you stand with us as together we reverence the reading of God's word in Job chapter 13 and verse number 15. There's some powerful preaching right there. No matter what version of the Bible you have, verse 15 ought to read a little something like this. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Girl, you don't need nothing else. Sit down right there. The, the, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I, I want to preach today the subject, I will trust in the Lord. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. I have shared with you all in confidence that I really like to cook. That's, that's, not, that's not right. I, I love to cook. There's nothing I enjoy more, Elijah, than being left alone in my kitchen to do what God has gifted me to do. I love cooking so much that when this preaching and pastoring thing is over, I'm going to try cooking professionally because I love to cook. Someone asked me, Pastor, where'd you develop your love of cooking? Very simple. My dad did all the cooking in our house. As a little boy, I was attached at the hip to my father, and whatever he did, I wanted to do. Whatever he was, I wanted to be. And my dad could show enough cook. 
My dad could fix just about anything you asked him to fix. And what I loved most about my dad is that he knew what I liked. And my dad would wake up in the morning and go into the kitchen and intentionally fix meals that he knew I desired. He knew my favorite stuff and would prepare it. Wasn't nothing like coming home to a good bowl of gumbo. Coming home from college and dad had fried some chicken. Joe, when church was over, we go home to smothered pork chops with rice. Mm, my, my father, Aaron, could make a mean combination of mustard and turnip greens. Not with that turkey y'all put in it. No, 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 no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It ain't greens without some ham hock just to put a little flavor in it. My, my dad would put his foot in some red beans and rice. And his bread pudding was not to be beat. My dad would fix the meals that I like. But every now and then, he'd put something on my plate that I did not appreciate as a child. I, I like it now as an adult, but I got to be honest, as a kid, I could not stand okra. I didn't like the taste nor the texture of okra. Reggie, on general principle, I don't like nothing slicker than me. That's just... I don't care how you fix it. If you boil it, I didn't like it. If you stewed it with tomatoes, I didn't like it. You could even fry it, and I didn't like it. Let me tell you something. You know you don't like something if you don't like it fried. A little hot oil and a whole lot of hot sauce will make everything all right. And, and Vernon, I made it clear to my dad on multiple occasions, I don't like okra. I was clear about it. And yet every now and then, there'd be some okra on my plate. Every now and then, this man who could fix whatever he wanted to fix, this man who said he loved me. <laughs> this man who gave me what he knew I liked. Every now and then, he would put on my plate something I was clear I did not like. What I can't figure out is how do you say you love me? And how do you give me the good things I want? And how do you hear me tell you what I don't like? And yet somehow you find a way to put on my plate what you know I don't want. And whenever I would ask this man who said he loved me and could fix whatever he wanted and gave me what I desire, why he would give me okra, he gave me the same answer. Every now and then, you need some okra because it's good for you. <laughs> Beloved, every now and then, you need on your plate something you don't like, but something that's good for you. That's why every now and then when you come to church, you need a good helping of Job. Because you need to be reminded that we serve a God who does not always taste good. A God who doesn't always tickle you and make you smile. Let's be honest, none of us really like Job. You don't run to Job for devotional reading. <laughs> because Job gives us a God who doesn't taste good. Dr. Richmond, it's a God who allows bad things to happen to good people. And I don't care how you fix it, how you fry it, how you serve it up. I've got problems with a God who allows me, while I'm trying to be righteous, to go through some struggles that he ought to keep me from. I don't know what to do with a God who hears a simple request that he could say yes to and he decides to give me a no. 
I don't, I don't like a God who sees me being Christ-like and nice to folk I don't even like on general Christian principle. I don't cuss at folk like I used to. I don't slap folk like I want to. And yet God sees my righteousness and still allows all hell to break loose in my life. I don't like that God. And if the truth be told, I thought I made it clear to him the things I don't like. God, you heard me when I said no sickness and disease and you let it come anyway. You heard me when I told you no cancer and it showed up anyway. You heard me when I asked you to make a way and you didn't do it. I was clear that I was sick and tired of her and she's still coming to church. <laughs> Our God does not always operate the way we want. And every now and then you need a good dose of Job to remind you how to handle it when God doesn't do what you thought God should do. You may not like Job, but you need Job. Because at some moment, you're going to be Job. At some moment, God is not going to do what you thought God should do. At some moment, you're going to be righteous and still struggle. At some moment, you're going to endure an experience that leaves you scratching your head, wondering how a God who loves you would allow you to go. Have you ever been in a Job moment? Allow me to give you the background so you don't miss the breakdown, a little context, so you don't miss the content. In case you don't know about Job, you can read about him in this book. The first two chapters tell you everything you need to know. Job is from a town called Uz, and Job is the best man in the whole land. Matter of fact, Job is so much the man that when you go to the elementary school in Uz and you ask kids to write an essay on what they want to be when they grow up, they all say Job. <laughs> Here's Job's resume. He's blameless, he's upright, he fears God, and he shuns evil. That's all the Bible tells you about Job. He's blameless, he's upright, he fears God, and he shuns evil. Do you hear the holiness in that resume? Blameless, upright, fears God, shuns evil. <laughs> None somebody tell him that ain't your resume. That ain't your, that ain't. <laughs> um, Job is holy. And Job is prosperous. Job is an entrepreneur. Job earns a seven-figure salary. Job is the man everybody wants to be. And after being introduced to Job, the writer takes us to the divine counsel of God. God is gathered and angels are present and God is speaking and all of a sudden, Satan shows up. Because you do know wherever God is present, and the righteous gather, Satan shows up. Now that's why y'all not be surprised about how ugly church can be, because whenever the righteous get together, don't look at nobody, that ain't Christ-like, just stop that. <laughs> Satan shows up. God asks Satan a simple question. What you up to? Satan's response, man, you know, I'm just chilling. Um, I'm doing what I do. I'm looking for somebody I can mess with. And out of nowhere, for no reason, God says, have you tried Job? God puts Job on Satan's radar. Aisha, God tells Satan, you can mess around with Job. He volunteers Job for some struggle. Lord, there's a whole lot you can do for me in my life. But the one thing I don't ever 
need God to do on my behalf is put me on Satan's radar. Baby girl, I got enough trouble I bring on my own. I don't need God volunteering me for struggle. Have you considered Job? Satan's response is this. Yeah, I did, but you got a hedge around him. Satan says, but God, here's what, here's what I'm going to tell you. I double dog dare you to take your hand off of Job. And if you let me have him for a few moments, I'll make him curse you to your face. Satan so says, just give me a few days and Job will walk away from you. God says, I'll take that bet because ain't nobody like Job. Nobody's got faith like Job. Nobody loves me like Job. Nobody is committed to me as Job. Go on and let's see what's going to happen. And within two chapters, Job loses everything. No, no, not, not everything. Everything. <laughs> two chapters. All of his camel and oxen are slaughtered. His sheep burn up in fire. His employees murdered. One day, not one, not two, not three, not five, not seven, not eight, but ten of his children die in a tragedy at the same time. And at the end of chapter two, Job is sitting with disease in his body. Have you ever been there? When just when you thought it couldn't get worse, <laughs> it sure enough did. You ever had a Job moment? When if it wasn't one thing, yeah, I'm preaching, y'all, y'all stay, you, I'll finish this. <laughs> it was something else. Have you ever had a Job moment when what you prayed God wouldn't allow happen was exactly what God brought to your doorstep? And while Job is struggling and suffering and in pain, his wife shows up. And his wife gives him some advice. Job's wife says at the end of chapter 2, why don't you curse God and die? She says, Job, you ought to give up on God. Now, before you get so holy and righteous that you want to judge Sister Job, can we admit that there have been some moments when giving up on God made sense? There have been some moments when you told yourself this faith thing ain't working. There have been some moments when you told yourself, why in the world do I get up every week, go to church, drive around, wait because they late at the 930 service. <laughs> I got to park two blocks away. I got to wear flats on the cobblestone, change my shoes when I get into the narthex. I go through all of that and all hell still breaks loose. What's the point? Have you ever wanted to break up with God? Have you ever wanted to send God a message and tell him this ain't working out? Have you ever looked at what God was doing and tell him, listen, you need to step your game up? Have you ever wanted to ask God from the Gospel of Janet Jackson, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> if you've never been there, I've been there. My dad served the Lord for over 30 years, preached and pastored for 20, at a church that never grew above 200, that could never pay him or respect him the way he deserved. And I watched him die of prostate cancer. He whittled away from over 200 pounds to 120. I had to change my father's diapers. And when he died, I was done with God. Doing this no more. This is what you get for being faithful. This is the end result of being righteous. You couldn't find a better way to call him home. I'm done with you. You ever been there? And here's Job, 
losing everything. Children dead, business gone, body sick. And yet he has the faith to make this kind of statement. In verse 15 of chapter 13, Job says, if God slays me, I still trust him. I still believe in him. I still have faith in God. When the worst happens, I still trust God. Well, if that's where we got to land in life, if we're going to make it. But how do you get there? How do you get to that place where you've got that indestructible faith? How do you reach a place where you've got that trust in God that nothing can challenge and nothing can change? How do you reach a place where you say, no matter what happens, I trust God? It starts with looking at the nature of his faith. Listen to what Job says clearly. He says, if God slays me, I'll still trust him. Okay, don't, don't, don't miss this. If God slays me, I'm going to trust him. No matter what he does, I trust in who he is. Watch this, Rosette, because real faith is not rooted in what you expect God to do. Real faith is rooted in you know who God is. So that no matter what goes on down here, I trust and believe that he's the same God up there that I know him to be. No matter what the diagnosis, no matter what the layoff, no matter what the election results, I trust and believe that no matter what I go through, God is still real. Many people give up on God because their faith was not in God. Their faith was in God doing what you thought God would do in response to what you did. Come, come here, come here, come here, come here. So when Satan is talking to God in chapter 1, that's what it's all about. Satan says this to God. Job doesn't trust you for nothing. There's a reason he trusts you. He trusts you because he found out there's a formula at work. When he's righteous, you reward him. When he's blameless, you bless him. When he shuns evil, you save him. And the gist of Satan's comment is this. That's not faith. That's a formula. And Satan understands that most of the folk who claim to have faith in God, you really don't have faith in God. You've got faith in a formula. You've got faith that if you act right and get yourself together and start reading your Bible and start coming to church, that God will respond by doing the very things you want God to do. And that's not faith in God. That's faith in a formula. So here's what Satan says to God. I feel it right here. Satan says, God, this is what I dare you to do. Break the formula. Let him do right and still wind up with wrong and watch how quickly he walks away from you. Um, let her pray and you don't answer and watch how quick she stopped praying. Uh, let him come to church every week and still get laid off and watch how quickly he stay at home. Uh, let, let him try to do right and wind up sick and watch how quickly they'll stop doing right because Satan's test is whether your faith is in God or whether your faith is in the outcome of what you think God ought to do. And what Job teaches us is that every now and then, I've got to remind myself that my faith is not in the outcome. My faith is in the God that I know that I serve. So watch this. Can I teach Bible? Is it all right? Let's teach the Bible. Rachel, here's what I want you to know, that the book of Job is written around the time of the Babylonian exile. For those not familiar with that term, in 587 B.C., the Israelites were conquered by the Babylonians under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar. Read the book of Daniel. And when they are conquered, 
Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is burned, and Israelites are sent into Babylon to live in exile. They live in exile 70 years until the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians and the emperor Cyrus gives an edict that allows the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem. And through all of this, the people of God have one question on their mind. And their question is, how could God let this happen to us? How could a God who loves us allow our city to be destroyed? How could a God we worship allow the temple to be burned? How could a God we serve send us into exile? And the only answer that they were hearing was an answer that came from the prophets. So while Israel's is trying to figure this out, Jeremiah, Hosea, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all give Israel the same answer. And the answer is this. The reason you're struggling is because you've sinned. And God operates, watch this, under a formula of distributive justice. Let the church say distributive justice. Here's all distributive justice means. That what you do determines what God will do. If you act right, God will reward you. If you mess up, God will punish you. And so all Israel knew was distributive justice. And the book of Job is written to remind us that God is bigger than a formula of distributive justice. Here it is, here, come here. So when Job is interacting with his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they represent the traditional theological understanding of distributive justice and say to Job, you had to do something because God would not punish you if you hadn't done anything. But we know that Job is blameless, upright, fears God, and shuns evil. So that as we read through Job, we find out that God does not always operate according to a formula. That sometimes bad things happen to good people. Now, that makes you get quiet. But what I tell you, what ought to make you shout, is that if God is not locked in to a formula of distributive justice, that means not only do sometimes bad things happen to good people, but here's what happens all the time. Good things happen to bad people. Uh-huh. Now, 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 here's why you missed your shout. Because you think you always a good person. But if you remember how bad you've been and how low you've fallen and how many mistakes you made, and God was good to you in spite of all that. You ought to be shouting right now, God's been better to me than I deserve. Is there anybody here who knows I haven't always been holy? I haven't always been righteous, but God has always been good to me. When I didn't deserve it, he was good to me. When I fell low, he was good to me. When I disobeyed him, he was good to me. And I thank God that he's bigger than a formula. My faith is not in what he does. My faith is in who he is. What he does is not limited to a formula, God does what God wants to do, and I trust that he's God. Watch this, watch this. God says, have you thought about Job? Watch, I want to see how, how awake you are. Satan says, yes. Um, but the problem, Anthony, um, you got a hedge around him. Huh? Uh, you, 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 got, you got this fence around him. And, and so Satan says this, watch this. I dare you to take your hand off him and watch what I do. Okay, I want to make sure you get this. 
Satan says, I would get at him, but there's a hedge around him. Um, but if you take your hand off him, watch what I can do. You, you haven't caught it yet. The problem for Satan is that there's a hedge. And Satan says, well, take your hand off. Uh, uh, what Satan literally says is, listen, I know there's a hedge, but take your hand. Now, now here's the problem. If you're awake, if the hedge is the problem, why doesn't Satan say, get rid of the hedge? Uh, Satan says, listen, there's a hedge, but take your hand off. Uh, Satan realizes, watch this, that, that your hand may be taken off, uh, but the hedge ain't going nowhere. That even when I don't feel his hand on my life, I know his hedge is still around me. My God, somebody today, you can declare that the only reason you're here right now is because the hedge of God has been protecting you all along. That when I didn't feel blessed, I was still protected. When he gave me a no, he still protected me. When I got laid off, he still protected me. When my heart was broken, the hedge was still there. Is there anybody in this church who can shout over the hedge? I thank God that he kept me. That in moments when it seems like his hand is no longer on me, his hedge is still around me. God never removes the hedge. Here it is. God always has you fenced in. Uh, can I teach Bible right here? Um, when I say fence, most of you think of a, a chain wire, a link fence. That, that's not what the biblical fence was. When shepherds wanted to fence their sheep in, they would grab thorn bushes and they would huddle the sheep up and they'd plant thorn bushes all around. And the thorn bushes hedged the sheep in. Now, I want you to know the hedge, the fence, served two purposes. It not only kept the predator out, it kept the sheep from wandering. Because the Lord says the problem is not just that predator try to get in. The problem is that sheep have a tendency to wander. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you a little slow. Um, Anthony, I, I, I want to say this. Um, in the words of Jeremiah Wright, I am a unapologetically Christian and unashamedly black. Um, I, 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 I love blackness. I love, let me tell you something. We, we're the most creative folk you never want to meet in life. Um, everything we do, we do with style. Give us a pen and paper, we'll blow your mind. Put a mic in front of our mouth, we'll sing you crazy. There's a, a, a writing on the wall on the fourth floor of the museum of African-American history and culture. It says, God created culture, black people created style. <laughs> Everything we do, we do with style. Cliff, we can't even walk straight. We, you know, we got <laughs> You ain't never seen nobody in their room sideways. <laughs> you know, we can't just wave, we can have. <laughs> Everything we do, we do with style. That style shows up in our culture, and, and one of the places I love watching black culture and style and, and genius is in theater. Um, I love seeing Alvin Ailey on stage. There's nothing like those beautiful brown, black bodies in motion. But Dean Stafford, beyond Alvin Ailey, let me tell you who I love the most, August Wilson. For those who don't know, August Wilson is a famous African-American playwright. He's most known for his 10 plays, which are called the Pittsburgh Cycle. 
Each play is set within a different decade from 1900 all the way to 1990, depicting African-American life in those different decades. Beautiful plays. Plays like Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Plays like Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Plays like Piano Lesson. Plays like Two Trains Passing. My favorite is a play called Seven Guitars. And the one you probably know most is a play called Fences. Fences was just released in the movie theaters about a year back. And if you saw it on film, you saw Denzel play the lead role. But if you saw it like me on Broadway, it wasn't Denzel who played it. It was another bad brother long before Denzel named James Earl Jones. If you've never seen Fences, it's a beautiful play. It's a story about a black family, Troy the husband, Rose the wife, and Corey the son. Troy is a gifted baseball player, but is denied entrance into the major leagues because of color. He's so bitter and broken about being denied despite his talent that when his young son, Corey, shows talent in football and gets a full-ride scholarship to play football in college, Troy will not allow him to play. He does not want his son to deal with the same racial discrimination he dealt with, and Corey and Troy wind up fighting. Corey leaves the house and joins the Marines. Troy is left at home with his wife, Rose. Now, Troy loves Rose, but Troy has a tendency to wander. <laughs> he loves him some Rose, but he wanders. And one time while wandering, he winds up with a baby. The baby's mother dies, and Troy has the audacity to bring the baby back to Rose to raise. Rose looks at the baby, fathered by her husband with another woman, and she says one of the strongest and coldest lines you will ever hear from a black woman. She looks at that baby, and this is what she says to Troy. She says, from this moment on, that baby has a mother, but you ain't got no woman. Ooh! She says, I'll raise this child, but you ain't got no woman. Uh, uh, do me a favor, nurse somebody tell them, don't play with them, sisters. Don't play. Don't, don't, don't play with them, sisters. Mark, they cold-blooded. He brings the baby home. Rose begins to raise the child. Troy dies. Corey does not want to come home to the funeral because of his hatred for his father, but his mother convinces him. When he comes home, he realizes that his dad has been building a fence around the house. He finishes his father's work, and the last line of the play is Rose making this statement. Some fences were meant to keep people out. And some fences were meant to keep people in because some people wander too much. And could it be that we shout over the fence that God has placed around us, not realizing that the fence is not just meant to keep some stuff out, but the fence is meant to keep you locked in? that God puts you in some situations where you've got to choose to trust him. I choose to trust God. I choose to believe in God. I choose to walk with God every now and then. Faith is a choice you have to make. Every now and then you've got to see what's going on in your life and make a decision, I trust God. No matter what is happening, no matter how bad it hurts, no matter how long it's been going on, I choose to trust God. I choose to come to church. I choose to pray in the morning. I choose to trust God. And the way your Bible is written it's meant to help you make that choice. Can I teach Bible? I know I'm supposed to close with a shout, but I feel like closing with something that you've never seen before. Your Old Testament, 
The books of your Old Testament were not originally in the shape you have them. They are originally the scriptures of the Israelites in what we know as the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible, when Christianity got a hold of it, changed it up in two ways. Number one, the number of books. The Hebrew Bible, the original, has 24 books. Yours has 39. So the question you ought to be asking is, where the extra books come from? It's not that they're extra books. It's that in the Hebrew Bible, 1 and 2 Samuel is considered one book. 1 and 2 Kings, one book. 1 and 2 Chronicles, one book. Ezra and Nehemiah, one book. All the 12 minor prophets, one book. So when the Christians got a hold of it, they separated them out and made 1 Chronicles a book, 2 Chronicles a book, Ezra a book, Nehemiah a book, so that we have 15 more books than are in the Hebrew Bible. Teach that Bible, Pastor Wesley. Um, and the second thing you'll note, not only are there more books, but the order of the books is different. When you go through the Hebrew Bible and you see the order of the books, stay with me. The book of Job is the 16th out of 24 books, and it is followed by the Song of Solomon. So in the Hebrew Bible, Job is all the way at the end, and it's followed by the Song of Solomon. When you get to the Old Testament in the Christian version, Job, watch this, is number 18 out of 39. Job is before the halfway mark. Those who put the Bible together on the Christian side said you can't leave Job to the end. Job has got to be in the middle because before you get to the middle of your life, you've got to make a decision that I'm going to trust God no matter what comes my way. My brother, my sister, you can't get but so old before you make a decision that I'm going to put my trust in God. Shame on the gray-headed saint that ain't got no faith. Shame on the senior citizen that can't trust God. Shame. You've got to make a decision before you get halfway in your life to trust God. Oh, but I like this even more. The Hebrew Bible, Job, is followed by the Song of Solomon. But in the Christian Bible, they flipped it up. They said, because after you get through Job, we got to put in the Psalms because the Psalms are the songs of praise because after you learn to trust God, then you learn how to praise God. After you trust him, you can bless him. Goodbye, Alfred Street. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But is there anybody here that can praise God because you trust God. Hey, I will bless the Lord at all times. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Uh, I got to go, y'all. But can I tell you how to identify the folk who really trust God? It's real simple. When they come to church, they are the first folk to get on your nerve. They shout when it ain't shouting time. They stand up when it ain't stand up time. They get happy all by themselves. Cause I trust God. I trust God. I trust God. Somebody declare, I trust God. Come on, won't you stand? Listen, it's really this simple. I've been trying to preach for 10 years that life always boils down to one question. No matter how big your problem, no matter how long you've been dealing with it, it boils down to one question. Do you trust God? In the sickness, do you trust God? When someone who once said I do now says I don't, do you trust God? When friends are fake and enemies are real, do you trust God? 
Lord, today many of us walk into this space having experienced Job and maybe even living in it right now. At a crossroads of wondering, can I still trust you? Today, oh God, I pray that as my sister and my brother walk in Job's shoes, you'll put Job's word in their heart. If God slays me, I will trust him. My trust, oh God, is not just in what you do. My trust is in who you are. And I make a deliberate decision to trust you because there's been a hedge around me all this time. It's not only kept some things from coming my way, Lord, it's keeping me from leaving right now. So that I trust you enough to keep praying. I trust you enough to keep reading. I trust you enough to keep coming. I trust you enough to keep serving. I put my trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.